Hello everyone, I'm Nath Portlock. Welcome, I'll be the moderator and host for the session today. I'm speaking to you from the Netherlands and uh, from all of us here at Uplucid, I'd like to extend an extremely warm welcome to you. I'm really looking forward to learning from you, to reflecting on your questions and to sharing this space with such curious and like-minded people. And what better place could there be for curiosity than the dreamscape? So I'm really looking forward to Robert, uh, Robert's talk. There's a lot of expertise in this room and cumulatively speaking, we probably have hundreds if not thousands of years of professional and uh, differing cultural experience as well. Um, as dreamers, I can only begin to guess uh, to the places we've been and, and the things we've seen. I think it'd be nice to greet each other, actually, and um, to, to wave and say hello in our first language. So I hope uh, we're all okay doing that. Um, we're not just pixels, we're also human beings. So uh, we're going to unmute you now. And after three, uh, we'll, uh, we'll all say, say hello in our first language. I forgot my first language there. So I hope everybody's ready. Okay. One. Two, three. Hello. Hello. Namaste. 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 Hello. Namaste. Hello. 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 Good. Hi. Thank you. Great. Great. It's, it's, I can see everybody now. That's nice. So, uh, thank, thank you so much for doing that. So, before we get started, a few bits of housekeeping. We're very happy to have Stream of Consciousness here with us today who are running the technical support. So thank you to all of you doing that behind the scenes in the practical realm. Uh, the format for today is that I'll say my part for a few minutes and then we'll be handing over to Robert. And Robert's workshop will take around 50 minutes. We'll then have a short five minute comfort break and then we'll go into the Q&A. So the format for the Q&A is that uh, you will ask your own questions. So you'll write your questions in the chat along with your full name and we will invite you uh, to speak and you just raise your hand in the uh, reactions menu at the bottom of your screen and we'll come and find you and unmute you and you can put your question to Robert yourself but we'll go through that again in a bit. Uh, the scheduled time for the Q&A is 25 minutes. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can so the finish time is set for one hour and 30 minutes from now. So a little bit about who we are. Well, Uplucid is an inter. So a little bit about who we are. Uplucid is an interdisciplinary platform of educators and therapists for educators and therapists. We're trying to connect and empower people who work with people, and hopefully make the world a bit better in the process. And our mission is about building skills and sharing best practice sharing the knowledge and the practical and often progressive tools and approaches that improve our lives and the lives of the people we work with. Well, who are you? Well, if you're here, it's very likely that you're looking for depth, knowledge and understanding, uh, but probably you're already nurturing those things within your life and your professional practice. It's, it's exciting that we at the beginning of this journey can be together to let this curiosity flow in both directions. And we exist because we realize that there's often a, a bit of a distance between the world of academia, what happens in research on, on the mountain, if you like, of research and what happens in the field, that these these two contexts are very deeply related, but they're not always deeply connected. And so what we wanted to do was firstly create a connection digitally and through, through content in a way that we can remove some of that loneliness of being a, a practitioner and being a freelancer because it can be quite a quite a solitary existence and also to to build links between academic research and what's going on in the field you know how do those two different contexts inform one another and how we can how can we improve the flow of that information in both directions so our proposal is a re really a simple one it's that through Uplucid, research and practice become integrated. Uh, we're delighted that you're joining us on part of that journey today. And before I introduce Robert, I'll just say a quick word about the Uplucid Summit. That's happening on the 3rd to the 5th of November. It's a three-day psycho-spiritual summit 
including nine uh, practice oriented workshops um, and Robert will be there. Uh, the first day will be focused on mindfulness based practices with workshops on awareness and technology, mindful self care and guided meditations on emptiness. The second day is focused on novel therapeutic practices with workshops about internal family systems, the therapeutic effect of clothes and styling and the emotion aid method, um, which Gina Ross spoke about last week. Uh, the third day is titled Psycho-Spiritual Integration, and this starts with a, wor a workshop about psychedelic integration. Um, we continue that day with a talk about developing resilience in times of spiritual awakening. And we close the summit with a workshop about the journey of supporting a dying person. So early bird sale, the early bird sale rather, <laughs> is on now and uh, $65 for uh, the first 100 tickets. So you can check more about that at uplucid.org. So now to Robert Wagoner. Well, Robert Wagoner might be one of the world's most conscious dreamers, author of the widely acclaimed book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self and co-author of the award-winning Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple. Robert is a former president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And in addition to his regular appearances as a guest speaker and lecturer, he's also co-editor at the freshly revamped Lucid Dreaming magazine. Check that out at dreaminglucid.com. A lucid dreamer since 1975, Robert, you've explored lucid dreaming very deeply and you've helped many others to discover how they can use lucid dreaming to access their inner creativity, to heal emotional and physical trauma, and to engage their inner awareness and experience transformational growth. Robert, I'm sure that I'm not alone in saying that dreams are still a bit of a mystery to me, and I'm incredibly excited to have you as our guest and guide here today. We'll now unmute everybody as we welcome Robert Wagoner. Uh, th thanks so much, Nathan. I appreciate uh, this. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, four different techniques that you can use to become lucidly aware. And, but first I want to explain a little bit about the science of lucid dreaming. So scientists knew uh, back in the 70s that during the dream state, we normally have rapid eye movement. Our eyes move left and right and while we're in the dream state. And as they started to meet people who said that they could lucid dream, or that is become consciously aware of dreaming while in the dream state, they wondered, how could you scientifically validate that? How could you prove that lucid dreaming really existed because it's happening inside your mind? And that was when Keith Hearn in England and separately, uh, Stephen LaBerge at Stanford University in the United States, they separately came up with an idea. They thought, what if I bring a lucid dreamer into the sleep lab? And then I tell the lucid dreamer, we're going to have a rapid eye movement polygraph pad on your eyes, so it'll record your eye movements. When you become lucidly aware, we want you to move your eyes left to right eight times. And that signal will be captured on the rapid eye movement polygraph pad. And that'll provide the evidence for lucid dreaming. And so that's what happened in April of 1975. Alan Worsley was at the sleep lab of the University of Hull in England. And he became consciously aware within a dream that he was dreaming he moved his eyes left to right eight times in the lucid dream and on the rim polygraph pad, it showed this interesting eye movement, left, right, left, right, eight times. And that's how the scientific evidence for lucid dreaming emerged. So the evidence came out around 1980. But interestingly, in 1975, I taught myself how to become consciously aware in a lucid dream. And here in a few minutes, I'm gonna share that technique with you on how you can become lucidly aware and discover what lucid dreaming is like. So again, the definition of lucid dreaming is that you realize within the dream that you're dreaming. You literally might stop and say, hey, wait a second, 
this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And as soon as you become lucidly aware, then you're on something of an open platform. You can decide what you want to do. Do you want to fly? Do you want to walk through a wall? Do you want to talk to a dream figure? Or do you want to do something truly incredible, like to begin to meditate in a lucid dream and have an incredible experience? So when you start lucid dreaming, you really exist in an open platform. You can do anything that you want in that open platform. The problem is, though, that sometimes people become lucidly aware and they'll just use that space to have fun. They'll use it to fly around or, or do whatever. They'll just have fun. But you can take lucid dreaming very, very deeply. In my two books, uh, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self and the Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, I talk about some of the value of lucid dreaming. And, and I really see that there's five important things that you can use lucid dreaming for. First, you can use it to access creativity. So imagine if in waking life, you're an artist and you become lucidly aware. As soon as you become lucid, you can announce, now when I go into that next room, I'll see incredible art that I can create. And you walk into that next room and there on the walls is incredible art that your unconscious creativity has created for you. Or if you have a work problem, like a software programmer uh, wrote to Stephen LaBerge, when he became lucid, he would call out for Albert Einstein to come help him. And then he and Albert Einstein would sit there and figure out a software coding problem. And he said, as soon as they solved it in the lucid dream, he would tell Einstein to go away so he could memorize the solution. He would memorize it, wake up with the solution. And he said, 99% of the time when he took that solution to work, it was a solution that really got the job done. It really worked. So you can use lucid dreaming to access creativity. Also, you can use lucid dreaming for emotional healing. In fact, already psychotherapists are using lucid dreaming to help people who have recurring nightmares from PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of times those people, after a traumatic event, every night they'll have the same nightmare over and over. And this really affects the quality of their sleep. But back in 1982, the first therapist, Gordon Halliday, thought, I wonder if you could teach them to become lucidly aware and end the recurring nightmares. And so he worked with his clients who had PTSD, recurring nightmares, and he told them, figure out a point in that nightmare where you can become lucidly aware, where you can realize, hey, this is a dream. It's that same old nightmare. And then when you become lucid, just change one thing, just change one thing in the nightmare. And what he discovered is when his clients did that, became lucid, changed one thing in that lucid dream, then their nightmares basically ceased. Since that time, lucid dreamers have used lucid dreaming to end phobias, get rid of their fear of snakes, their fear of heights, their fear of public speaking, what their fear of flying, whatever it is, lucid dreamers have realized you can get rid of those fears too. Also, lucid dreamers have used it to reduce their anxiety in the waking state and overcome negative habits or, or obsessive compulsive disorder. So I think this area of lucid dreaming is going to be very promising for psychology as people learn all the ways you can use lucid dreaming to deal with emotional issues and achieve emotional healing. Also, you can use lucid dreaming, I feel, for physical healing. Now, this hasn't been scientifically studied, but in my magazine, my free online magazine, Lucid Dreaming Experience, we'll oftentimes have issues that focus on physical healing in lucid dreams. And some people have reported incredible healings in the lucid dream state. 
Now it's interesting that in Buddhist dream yoga philosophy, they say that an action performed at the level of a lucid dream is nine times more powerful than one performed at the waking state. And, and so why is that? It's because in a lucid dream, you're deep down into your unconscious mind. There you can make affirmations, you can focus your intent, and it can result in profound changes or profound experiences. And one of these ways that I talk about in my books is also to use it for physical healing. So for example, a gentleman uh, submitted his, his story to our magazine. He had read my books and he had gastroesophageal reflux disorder, which people call GERD. It was so bad that he could not sleep laying down at night. He had to sleep sitting up against the wall with some pillows. And so he read my book, he knew he had had lucid dreams. And so he decided he'd use lucid dreaming to heal his GERD. And so one night he became lucidly aware. He hadn't really figured out a plan, so he didn't know how to respond. And he, he tried to do something and in the morning felt a little bit better. But this just convinced him that he had to create a plan, like I talk about in my books. The next time he became lucid, he remembered his desire to heal himself. He asked for the assistance from the dream figures. They all agreed that they would help heal him. And then from their hands came blue light into his stomach. And he said he felt this incredible energy. And when he woke in the morning, he knew he was physically different. And after that, all the symptoms of his GERD disappeared. So it's truly incredible how profound uh, lucid dreaming can be at helping people deal with physical issues, whether it's your bad knee or whatever issue it is, there's some profound stories of lucid dream healing. The next area of value of lucid dreaming is this idea of engaging what I would call your larger awareness. And here I'm, I'm talking about your inner self, or, or maybe you'd prefer to think of it as your unconscious mind. So I began lucid dreaming in 1975. The scientific evidence emerged in 1980. And then in 1985, I realized that there is an awareness behind the dream in a lucid dream. And here's how it happened. Um, I was part of a group that had a monthly goal to achieve in a lucid dream. And one month, the goal was discover who the dream figures are. So I became lucid. I followed a woman into an office. There were four people there. I walked up to a gentleman and asked him, excuse me, what do you represent? Because I knew it was a dream. And so I was doing the goal. I asked him, what do you represent? And instead of him responding, a voice boomed out a response from above him. And it was just a partial response. So I looked up and I asked the voice, what? And the voice responded with the full answer of what that gentleman represented. Now in the morning, I thought, why didn't the dream figure respond? Why did this voice, this invisible voice respond? And so I began to think, is there an awareness behind the dream? Can you communicate with your unconscious mind? And so after that, I began to ignore the dream figures and I would just shout out questions to the awareness behind the dream. So for example, if you became lucid tonight, you could ignore the dream figures and you could announce to your unconscious mind, hey dream, show me something important for me to see. And normally when you do that, you'll, the lucid dream will change, something will appear, sometimes the entire lucid dream will change, but you'll be looking at something important for you to see. And you'll begin to see that you have a connection with your larger awareness and you can connect with it in the lucid dream state. So sometimes the entire lucid dream will change in response. Sometimes you'll have a vocal response uh, sometimes something interesting will happen, but it's truly profound when you begin to engage the awareness behind the dream. 
it's, it's truly incredible. That's why I call my first book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self. I showed that Carl Jung had identified 12 characteristics of the inner self and what, it would have, what someone would have to show to identify that everyone has an inner self. And in lucid dreaming, we see all of those characteristics, perception, imagination, feeling, will, all of that, you see it in a lucid dream. Because even in a lucid dream, sometimes you'll ask this non-visible awareness, hey, let me experience whatever it is. And then you'll hear this response, you're not ready for an experience of this magnitude. Come back when you're more focused and not distracted. So it, e it even cares about our current situation and our ability to deal with conceptual experiences that we might ask to achieve in a lucid dream. And so finally, that leads to my fifth reason for lucid dreaming, and that's for spiritual practices. So what I want to suggest to all of you, if you become lucid, um, ask to experience a spiritual concept or a quality of the divine. So it's much better to ask, hey, dream, let me experience unconditional love. Or, hey, dream, let me experience one minute of samadhi. That is much better than trying to find God or Buddha or, or whomever, because you'll get too excited when you try to do that and you'll wake up. But when you ask to experience a quality of the divine, then you'll begin to learn about your inner divine knowledge. And I'll tell you, it'll blow your mind. One time in London, I suggested to the group that I was meeting with that, that they do that. Shout out, hey, dream, let me experience unconditional love. And six months later, I was, I was back in London. A woman stood up and said that she had done that in her lucid dream after she heard me. She announced, now let me experience unconditional love. She said the resulting experience was so profound in that lucid dream that when she woke up from the lucid dream, she said she cried tears of joy for 15 minutes. She said she never knew how deep love could be. She never knew what unconditional love was and until she experienced it in lucid dreaming. So that's the beauty of lucid dreaming. You can actually even experience concepts. But if you also want to do spiritual practices, you can stop in a lucid dream and begin to meditate. And I'll tell you, if you begin to empty your mind in the lucid dream state, within 30 seconds, you will be at such a deep transcendent state that, that you'll be amazed. And if you do this in five or 10 lucid dreams, then you'll notice that in the waking state, when you meditate, you'll go to a very deep state very quickly. Instead of taking 20 minutes to get there, you'll get there in five or six minutes. So this truly impacts the person, not only uh, in the dream state, in the lucid dream state, but also in the waking state and your waking state practices. So now let's get to some of the techniques that you can use to become lucidly aware. So let me explain first how I taught myself how to become lucid in 1975. I was reading a book by Carlos Castaneda called Journey to Ixlan. And in this book, his shamanic teacher, Don Juan, told him to find his hands in the dream state and become consciously aware. And, and I was a young guy. I thought, what? You can do this? Well, what's it, where's the technique? How do you do it? But there wasn't a technique. So I just created one. So here is what I always tell people to do if you're new to lucid dreaming. Each night before you go to sleep, relax and sit there in bed and look at your hands. Look at your hands and tell yourself as you look at your hand, tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. So I do that for five minutes and fall asleep. And when I woke up 
if I was remembering my dreams, I'd say, oh, did I see my hands? After three nights of doing that practice before sleep, I'm walking through my high school and all of a sudden my hands pop right in front of my face and I go, oh, my hands, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And it was so incredible to realize, oh, the, those guys there, they're dream figures. And this wall that felt so cool and nubby, it's, it's dream stuff. And I went on to have an incredible lucid dream. So the great thing is when you begin to do this practice, you're, you're creating a conditioned response. So re remember how Ivan Pavlov would ring a bell every time he fed his dogs, he'd ring a bell. After a week of this, his dogs would begin to salivate and they called that a conditioned response. So here's what you're doing. You're making the sight of your hands result in you thinking, this is a dream, I'm dreaming this. So you might be climbing a ladder in your dream and see your hands and go, wait a second, my hands, this is a dream. You might be opening a door in your dream, see your hands and go, oh, my hand, this is a dream. So that's why you have to do it repeatedly. You're creating a connection between the stimulus, your hands, and the response, this is a dream, I'm dreaming this. So that's how I began lucid dreaming. And it was a very simple technique and uh, people, thousands of people around the world have used it to become lucid. The next technique that I use was simply the power of suggestion. So a lot of us know that we can be hypnotized uh, normally in the population, about 80% of the population can be hypnotized or be affected by the power of suggestion. And some of us are very suggestible. So this is how I use the power of suggestion before I'd go to sleep. I would tell myself before I went to sleep, tonight in my dreams, I'll be much more aware and when I notice something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming. So again, tonight in my dreams, I'll be much more aware. And whenever I notice something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming. And so that night, I might be walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden see a famous actress walk by. And I think, wait a second, what is that famous actress doing in my town? What is she doing in my neighborhood? And then I think, oh, this is too strange. This has to be a lucid dream. So by doing this suggestion, tonight in my dreams, whenever I notice something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming, you elevate your critical awareness. You bring it to a higher level. In most dreams, we just accept whatever happened. We see the queen walk by, oh, the queen's in town. We're driving a car, then we're driving a motorcycle, then we're driving a skateboard. Oh, we just go along with it. We just make up a story. But when you suggest to yourself, tonight I will be more critically aware, and when I notice something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming, then you've energized yourself to be on the lookout and notice when something is strange and therefore become lucid. So the power of suggestion is one of these great ways that you can use it to help yourself become lucidly aware. It's really a fantastic way. Now there's other suggestions you can use. For example, have you ever noticed when you had to get up early to catch a flight, you might have to get up at four in the morning and so you, you set your alarm clock and do all of that. And suddenly at four o'clock in the morning, you're totally awake. And 30 seconds later, the alarm clock goes off. When you have that experience, you realize some part of you knows the time. Some part of you remains aware, even though you're sleeping. So if you've noticed this before, you can use this suggestion. Tonight in my dreams, some part of me will, re will remain aware and it will make me understand when I am dreaming. So again, tonight, 
some part of me will remain aware and it will notify me when I'm dreaming so I become lucidly aware. In that way, you use that part of your unconscious mind that remains aware throughout the night and it'll help you achieve lucid dreaming. It'll help notify you, hey, this is a dream. It's interesting in dream reports, people oftentimes will say that, oh yeah, in my dream, uh, a dream figure came and asked me, could this be a dream? And in the dream, I looked around and I thought, yeah, how did I get here? Where, where is this? And they become lucidly aware. So sometimes even dream figures can help you become lucidly aware. Or you might see a billboard or a sign. Are you dreaming? And you realize that your inner self, your inner awareness is actually trying to help you become lucidly aware. So again, the power of suggestion is a wonderful way to, to get into the habit of lucid dreaming. Now, the third technique I want to talk about is one that was created by Stephen LeBerge, who became a researcher on lucid dreaming and is kind of connected to the science of lucid dreaming. He created a technique called the mnemonic induction of lucid dreams. And mnemonic is a word that means a memory device. So he wanted to use a memory device to help us induce lucid dream. So a, a memory device might be in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And so they'll teach that to small children to remind them when Christopher Columbus came over to the uh, Western hemisphere. But in any case, here's how Stephen LeBurge did it. And the acronym is M-I-L-D. So the M stands for memorize. When you wake up in the night, memorize the dream that you just had. Go over it in your mind until you have it clearly memorized. Then the I stands for insert yourself. So in that memorized, in that memorized dream, now insert yourself becoming lucidly aware. Oh yeah, I found myself in Central Park and I was walking along and then I saw a carriage and it was pulled by six goats. Oh, that's a strange thing. Why would six goats be pulling a carriage? Oh, that's where I could insert myself becoming lucidly aware. So now go over the dream, but with yourself becoming lucidly aware at some point in it. So you've memorized the dream, you've inserted yourself becoming lucid. Now see yourself becoming lucid and what you would do. Would you go flying to the Empire State Building? Would you talk to someone in Central Park? What would you do? And then allow yourself to fall asleep as you tell yourself, in my next dream, I'll realize I'm dreaming. In my next dream, I'll realize I'm dreaming. So that's the four-step process of the mild technique. Memorize the dream, insert yourself becoming lucid, imagine yourself lucidly aware. As you fall asleep, be determined. In my next dream, I'll become lucidly aware. By doing that technique, I increased the number of lucid dreams I had uh, by probably twice. And so that was a wonderful technique, but I found that I had to memorize the process during the waking state in order to remember it at four o'clock in the morning. So, so I use that M-I-L-D, memorize, insert, lucid, determination, be determined. That's how I began to use that process. And my final suggestion on how to become lucidly aware is to take advantage of the sleep state. Normally, as we go throughout the night, the dream state gets longer and longer. Every 90 minutes, we begin this process of dreaming. Our first dream might just last five or six minutes, but the final dream of the night might go on for 45 minutes. So you're much more likely to become lucid towards the end of the night, towards the morning hours. So if you wake up in the morning, as you go back to sleep, 
use this technique that people call the wake initiated lucid dreaming technique. They call it the counting technique. So it's four o'clock in the morning, you've waken up, you've taken a drink of water, or you've gone to the toilet and returned to bed. Now, as you fall asleep, do like this, say quietly in your mind, one, this is a dream, two, this is a dream, three, this is a dream, four, this is a dream. Oftentimes when you get to 23, this is a dream, then you'll see a dream space all around you and you'll realize, hey, this, this is a dream, I'm dreaming this. Or you'll hear yourself saying, blah, 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 this is a dream. And you look around and you'll think, wait, how did I get to the library? Oh, this is a dream. So the important thing about doing this in the middle of the night is that oftentimes in the middle of the night, neurologically, we're already connected to the dream state. We're already, we have just woken from a dream. And so now it's much more likely to re-enter a dream. And if we're telling ourselves as we allow ourselves to fall asleep, one, this is a dream, two, this is a dream, then, then you'll have much more success realizing, hey, this is a dream, I'm back in the dream state, and you'll be lucidly aware. So those are four simple techniques. Of course, there's probably a, a dozen more legitimate techniques that you can use to become lucidly aware. In my book, I, I have the technique that I use to get up to having 30 lucid dreams a month some nights I'd have three lucid dreams when I uh, realized how I could change the way that I related to the world and, and begin to lucid dream frequently. But those four lucid dreams will really help beginners. But now I wanna go to the next section of my talk and that's how to stay lucid and be able to explore the lucid dream and have a long stable lucid dream. Because for many beginners and many people, they become lucid, but within 30 seconds, they've popped out of the lucid dream and they've woken up. And so now I want to explain the techniques that I learned how to stay lucid and create a stable lucid dream. So let's say you become lucidly aware. There's three things that you can do to create a stable foundation. And here's the first. Stay calm, reduce your emotions. What you'll hear from many beginning lucid dreamers is they became lucid and they got so excited, they woke up. Or they became lucid because Tom Cruise was knocking at the door and they saw Tom Cruise and that was so exciting, they woke up. So what we learn, lucid dreamers all around the world, stay calm. So how do you stay calm when you first become lucid. Here's my suggestions. First, inside your mind, use those words, stay calm. Tell yourself, stay calm. Because anything that you say in the lucid dream is very powerful. If you tell yourself, stay calm, then you'll immediately begin to calm down. The next thing to do is if you're looking at something exciting, like Tom Cruise is at your front door, don't look at the exciting thing. Look down at, your floor, at the floor, look at your hands, something boring. If you do that, that'll reduce the amount of emotion you have and help you to stay calm. It's like in the lucid dream, you can get pretty emotional. You can have a pretty intense emotional experience, but if you go too far, it's like a circuit breaker on an electronic system. If there's too much energy, boom, you'll pop out and you'll wake up. So the first thing, tell yourself, stay calm. The next thing you want to do to stabilize the lucid dream, enhance your awareness. Enhance your awareness. So how can you enhance your awareness in the lucid dream? You become lucid, you've told yourself to stay calm. Now, do these things. Rub your hands together in the lucid dream. Even though they're dream hands, you'll have this physical sensation of your hands rubbing together. And that will make you more directly, solidly 
in that experience. Or ground yourself in the lucid dream. Reach out and touch something. Touch a nearby table, touch a nearby chair, touch the wall. And that will make you, will make that setting more real, more solid, more stable. So rub your hands together, touch something, or you can announce greater awareness now, more clarity now. Sometimes when you announce that, it's like you say greater awareness now, and it's like all of a sudden, it's like the lighting improves in the lucid dream. Because what's happening is your unconscious mind is responding to your request. Greater awareness now. Oh, someone turns up the lights. So it reflects back to you where your head is at. And you can always do that, especially if you find yourself become lucid in a very dim situation. Greater awareness now, and then it's like the lights go up. So that's how you can enhance your awareness. Rub your hands together, begin to touch something, announce greater awareness now, or more clarity now, and see how the environment changes. Now, the next step in this three-step process is maintain your focus. So you've become lucid, you've reduced your emotions, you've enhanced your awareness, but now you need to explore while all the time remembering this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. Because I'll tell you what happens to a lot of lucid dreamers. They go exploring in their lucid dream and they see something incredible. And they get so amazed by what they're seeing that they forget that they're dreaming. They forget that they're lucid. And then all of a sudden it seems so real that they just return to regular dreaming. So they became lucid. Maybe they were lucid for a minute or two, but then they went exploring and now they've just returned to regular dreaming. And this shows that lucid dreaming, our awareness, is not a steady state. It goes up and down. You can enhance your awareness, or if you're not careful, you can lose your lucid awareness and return to regular dreaming. So here's how you can maintain your focus. Every 30 seconds or so, announce to yourself, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. So if you do that every 30 seconds as you go along, oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. Oh, there's a dream house. Oh, look over there. There's a dream tree. Oh, there's the dream taxi. If you go and call everything a dream as you go throughout the dream, it'll help you keep in mind that you're in a lucid dream. Now, my friend Lucy Gillis, who's the co-editor of our free online magazine, lucid dreaming experience. She tells me when she becomes lucid, she'll begin singing. Just whatever words come to her mind, she'll start singing. And by that process of singing, as she flies around or does whatever, it keeps in her head that, oh, this is a dream. Because I wouldn't go around Vancouver singing like this. I'd only do it in a lucid dream because I know it's a dream. So in that way, she maintains her focus. But this is really important, especially for beginners. You've, you've got to maintain your focus because otherwise you'll go return to regular dreaming. Now, sometimes people ask me, well, what do you do if you know the lucid dream is gonna fall apart? Sometimes the lucid dream will appear shaky, like it's gonna fall apart. So here's what you can do. If you have used your hands to become lucidly aware, then I'd look back at my hands. Even though the lucid dream is, is starting to feel like shaky, just look back at your hands to renew the, the, the lucid dream. Or you can do this. This is an idea that Stephen LaBerge and others came up with. If you feel like the lucid dream is falling apart, start spinning around. Start spinning your body around in the lucid dream. He felt that by doing that, it would excite part of your brain that was connected with your vestibular system and, and your stability, and it would re restabilize uh, your experience. But oftentimes, as you spin around, 
Uh, you'll notice that when you stop spinning, now you have a new lucid dream environment in front of you. So those are some of the ways that when you notice that the lucid dream is getting ready to collapse, you can spin around, you can look back at your hands, and you can use that process to stabilize the lucid dream. So again, uh, um, I taught myself how to lucid dream in 1975. Um, I've had more than 1,000 lucid dreams. I've used it to access creativity, to resolve fears, to promote physical health. I've used it to engage my larger awareness. I've used it for these kind of spiritual practices of meditating, of asking to experience concepts in the lucid dream. I've, I've literally had my head blown. Uh, my mind has been blown by lucid dreaming. That's how deep lucid dreaming seriously is. Now, the important thing isn't how many lucid dreams you have. I've met people who have had many thousands of lucid dreams, but they just do the same thing over and over. They play around, they talk to friends, they, they just do whatever. They don't realize all these deep levels that you can take lucid dreaming to. And again, this is an open platform from which you can explore and, and, uh, and visit the world. So the quality of lucid dreaming is much more important than the quantity. The quality is much more important. And sometimes it's understanding these, these concepts that I've talked about. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, one time I, I was invited to Bogota, Colombia, and um, I gave a weekend workshop on lucid dreaming. And in that, I noticed that there was a woman in the front row who was a very good lucid dreamer because she asked questions that a good lucid dreamer would ask. But this woman also had a lot of pain in her face. Even though she was 40 years old, I could see all of this pain in her face. And during the course, I talked about how you could use lucid dreaming for emotional healing, but you should develop a plan before the lucid dream. So when you become lucid aware, you can remember, oh, here's my plan to emotionally heal myself. Six months later, they have me come back to Bogota and this woman walks through the door and now she looks taller and younger and more attractive and, and 70 or 80% of the pain is gone from her face. And she looked like a, almost a different person. I walked up to her and I asked her, what happened to you? She told me that she had never thought about the idea of emotional healing in a lucid dream. That had never occurred to her that, uh, that it was even possible. So she heard my suggestion on how to go about it. She developed a plan, just like I said. And then later that month, she became lucidly aware. She stabilized the lucid dream. And then she enacted her plan for emotional healing. And she told me that when she woke up from that experience, she knew she was a totally different person. And she, and she said, she said, Robert, here's the amazing thing. I can still remember the traumatic experiences in my life, but now there's no feeling connected to them. There's no hurt, there's no pain. It's, it's like I'm free of the pain now. And so this is how profound these can be when people begin to understand the conceptual uses of lucid dreaming. Because again, it's an open platform. If you want to have a thousand lucid dreams and just have fun and play around, you can do it. Nothing will stop you. But if you want to use it to resolve inner fears or the shadow, as Carl Jung might say, the denied, ignored, repressed energies that oftentimes are behind you in the dream state, you can use lucid dreaming to resolve that and, and get that energy back into you. So, so let me explain how that, that can happen. One night, uh, I, I find myself in a farmhouse in the southern part of the United States. And the farm wife puts beans on my plate. And I look around and I think, wait a second, I don't live on a farm. 
I don't live in the South. What is this? Oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. At that moment, I feel all this energy behind me. And immediately I know the shadow is often in the shadow's place behind the person. And in my classes, I always teach everyone, go to the area of the most energy. And so I turn around and, and there's a young black woman uh, smiling at me. And I pick her up and put her right in front of me. And then I ask an open-ended question. Who are you? Who are you? She responds, I am a discarded aspect of yourself. How do you respond to a discarded aspect? If she's discarded, it means she's been kind of let go or put away. So it, it occurs to me, if she's discarded, she wants to be accepted. And so from my heart, I begin to send her acceptance, total love and acceptance. And as I do so, the dream figure gets smaller and smaller. And then I totally accept her and she becomes light. And this light enters my torso and it was so energetic that I woke up. When I woke up, I knew I was different, but, but I couldn't figure it out. It was a week later that I realized ever since that lucid dream, I've been thinking, I should try to write that book on lucid dreaming. The project that I discarded a year ago after 50 pages. And I thought, oh, that's what that's all about. That's why I'm thinking about that project again. I've reconnected, I've reintegrated with all that discarded energy. And once I reconnected with it, then I was able to write my first book, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self. So this is how powerful lucid dreaming can be. But again, there's a lot of detail in there, and that's why I write books to help people go deeper and deeper and deeper into lucid dreaming, because I've just uh, touched the surface on lucid dreaming. Anyway, thanks, thanks everyone for your attention. Um, I think what I'll do now is hand the program back over to uh, Nathan, if he's still there, uh, and then we can open it up for questions and answers. How about that? Thanks, everyone. I really enjoyed that. I'm absolutely fascinated. You completely dissolved the, the idea of the computer and the camera and the pixels. And there's so much joy coming out of you. Uh, it's so inspiring, really. I, I, I really. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. And I know there's going to be so many questions. Um, so uh, Robert's able to stick around for t another 20, 25 minutes. And what, what I'd like you to do is just to look in your Zoom screen and at the bottom, you have the reactions. It's uh, in the menu. There's a, a smiley face, and if you click on that, you can put your your hand up in the reactions. And you're going to need that when you ask your question. So, what I'd like you to do is write your full name and your question into the chat. And what we'll do is I'll read your name out. When you hear your name, press the raise hand reaction. We'll find you. We'll unmute you and then you can ask your question. We've got a minute and a half, two minutes per person to, to pose your question. And uh, I know there's <laughs> literally uh, an entire universe of, of possibilities here. I've got a list here about a foot long of my own questions, Robert. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask <laughs> any of those. Um, we've got a question um, from Aya June. Aya, could you raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask your question to Robert? Welcome to you. Hi guys, Robert, thank you so much for your presence and your time today. Um, sure. I'm, I'm neuroscience trained, like I'm medically trained. This is completely outside of my science based life. Um, but I, I hired a spiritual coach because too many weird things were happening in my business and I just needed <laughs> some guidance. 
So I said to her, uh, my partner's brother died tragically about a month and a half ago. And I said, he keeps calling me on this rotary phone. Like, I don't know the house, I don't, but, he, but he's calling me. And she said to me, yeah, he's trying to get to his brother through you. And I didn't know whether to vomit or think she had lost her mind or, but she said, sign up to learn about lucid dreaming. And here I am. Uh, so any insight on that that you could offer would be great. You know, um, a week ago, I started up another 30-day uh, online program uh, workshop on lucid dreaming and living lucidly. And, and this is what always happens when I do that. People start reporting uh, a day or two before the workshop begins that they're seeing deceased relatives, they're seeing deceased loved ones, they're seeing people that they know who are deceased, you know, old boyfriends start to appear. And, uh, and, and it, it's, it's interesting, I've noticed this in almost all of my online workshops. Um, in the dream state, we can have visit, visitation dreams. We can encounter people that we know are deceased. Sometimes that helps us become lucidly aware. We see grandma and we think, wait a second, grandma passed away 10 years ago. How can this be? Oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. Now, at that moment, you have some decisions to make. Grandma might be a symbol, a projection of your own mind. She might be a symbol of your grief, for example. Or grandma might be there in her spiritual form in the after death state. So here's how you can go about working with that. You can say, Grandma, you're from the land of the dead. Tell me something outside of my knowing. And she'll say something like, oh, you don't know this, but your brother is going to divorce his wife. And you go, whoa, whoa, I don't know that. But anyway, you can ask questions of your grandma and and discover things that are outside of your knowing and then confirm them upon waking. That's the only rational way of dealing uh, with that moment because I, I've had that happen to me. Uh, my father has appeared and I've thought, wait a second, is this my father or the dream symbol? And then I've asked him a question um, and, and he responded and the things that he stated were going to happen ultimately happened. So, so that's the only way of, of going about it. Also, I, I do want to encourage you to look into the neurology of lucid dreaming. Uh, there's a wonderful neurologist, uh, Martin Dressler. Um, and also there's another neurologist, Ursula Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. And in both of their studies, uh, they put a 19 channel EEG skull cap on the lucid dreamer. The lucid dreamer signaled with their eyes that they were lucidly aware. And then they got a snapshot of what the brain looks like in a lucid dream state. And they could see that the frontal lateral parts of the cerebral cortex become active. And the Ursula Voss and J. Allen Hobson group, they called lucid dreaming a hybrid state of consciousness because the dreaming part of the brain, the ancient part of the brain is active and also parts of the cerebral cortex light up at the same time. So self-perception, self-awareness, the ability to decide what you want to do, all that shows up as, as the brain areas of activity and, and all. But anyway, um, so I think that's what's happening. It's, it's lovely that you uh, have an interest in lucid dreaming. And, and it's also lovely that you're a scientist who also uh, uh, realizes that there's more going on uh, than we know and you're willing to investigate that uh, on a spiritual path. So, so thank you. That's a, it's a lovely question. And exactly, Aya, thank you so much uh, for, for fusing those two worlds together in that question. Um, Carlos Sid, I think you've got a question uh, about the environment uh, that you sleep in. Are you, are you there, Carlos? Is your, is your hand hand up so we can find you? 
I'll just yeah. hold space okay. until we yeah, my question was, um, I noticed that in some places there are better dreams and I don't know if that is part of the suggestion that you spoke earlier. And for example, when I come to my folks house, um, I started to have more vivid dreams and um, I wasn't sure if what was the condition, if it was the people itself if it was the environment. Um, so I wanted to explain a little bit on, on how to, how can we work that out in favor of the dream? Right. Um, we might discover that there, some places are better for dreaming than others. And it might have to do with suggestion um, that let's say um, if I go to some place I feel is a spiritual community then I might have a lucid dream. But is it suggestion or is it something that's inherent in that place? It's hard to tell. But what I've seen is that oftentimes we become lucid when we feel very relaxed and at peace. And so oftentimes here in America, when we have the holidays at the end of December, Everyone gets to take a vacation for a week or two. I'm very much at peace. And in a week, I'll have eight lucid dreams. It's because I'm so relaxed. So it might be that you feel more relaxed at your parents' place, and therefore your lucid dreaming becomes more active. Your vividness of dreams becomes more active. Also, uh, you'll notice sometimes um, when you do things, uh, like let's say you work outside in the sun all day and you go to sleep and you're very tired that night you might have incredibly vivid dreams and you might even become lucidly aware and i think that's where we're getting into the neurochemical area of being outside in the sun working really hard it it makes our dream state go to a deeper level and sometimes we become lucid so you'll notice that there's miscellaneous things that might help you become lucidly aware. Um, and again, I think it's how we feel about places is the big issue and not necessarily the place itself. Thank you, Carlos. That was, that was one of my questions as well. So that is, yeah, great question. Um, thank you so much. The, there's a quick one from Susanna Hewitt. Uh, about the, could you just give the names of those neuroscience uh, researchers you mentioned again, please, Robert? I think some people want to make a note of those. Right. So Ursula, U-R-S-U-L-A, Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. Google search Ursula Voss and lucid dreaming research and things will come up. The other person uh, is Mart Martin. M-A-R-T-I-N, Dressler, D, like dog, D-R-E-S-L-E-R. -E -E Just Google search Martin Dressler and Lucid Dream Research and lots of things will come up. Thank you. I think probably one of our guys, uh, our team can put those in the chat in case uh, people didn't catch up, but thank you. There's uh, so one here from Jeffrey Lubin. Um, Jeffrey's bringing Freud in. It's about time. Uh, so Jeffrey, is your hand up? Would you like to ask your, your question? We'll just hold space for you until we can, until we can find you. Okay, no problem. We'll, we'll give Jeffrey a few more minutes. Uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila has a question. Is your hand up, Sheila? We are, we're searching for Sheila. I, I, know, I know you're in there somewhere, <laughs> Sheila. Okay. Okay. I don't think the camera's on, but I, I think it's nicer to do it this way, if, if possible, for people to ask in their own voice. What do you think, Robert? Well, I'm happy to have the questions read to me from the chat. That, that, that might move things along. Uh, 
uh, Nathan. Well, uh, Sheila, I think is unmuted now. So Sheila, we haven't got your video, but we've got your voice. Uh, we're, we're here. What's your question? I'm just curious about uh, lucid dream space versus an out of body, maybe remote viewing uh, space or visualization during a meditation. Right. So, so um, a lucid dream by definition is when you realize within a dream that you're dreaming. An out of body might occur when you have a heart attack and you're floating on the ceiling of the operating room as they try to get your lifeless body to come back to life. Or an out of body might occur as you're falling asleep and you begin to hear this humming noise like a thousand bees humming or you feel this weird energy all over your body, or you realize that, hey, I'm seeing my bedroom from six feet above my body. How, how can I do that? So again, a lucid dream is realizing within a dream that you're dreaming. In those normal out-of-body type experiences, I know you're aware in a different frame of awareness, but technically it's not a lucid dream. So I tell people a lucid dream and an out of body, it's like a house cat and a mountain lion. They share some characteristics, but they're not the same. They're just not the same. Thank you, Robert, for that, making that distinction. And thank you, Sheila, for that question. And uh, Parag Tawari, um, you've got a question about the relation between to dreaming and our waking state. Parag Tiwari, we're going to find you if you could raise your hand. And Okay, so I'm going to read out Parag's uh, for you. Um, so Parag wants to know, does lucid dreaming help in realizing the dream nature of our waking state? I, does it help us to wake up from the so-called waking state? It will if you go deeply enough. So here's a technique in my second book, Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple, that anyone can see that we exist now in a type of dream. Um, when my first book came out, a, a Buddhist abbot from a Buddhist temple in Europe wrote me and said that, that he goes, your book is entirely a book of dream yoga, of Buddhist dream yoga, but you never use those terms. And he said he knows because he spent three years in a dream yoga monastery. And, and he said, reading my book finally explained what the dream yoga monks were trying to teach him. Yeah. So one of the first lessons of dream yoga is all this a dream. They do not mean all this fantasy, all this an illusion. They mean all of this is a kind of mental creation. So I'm gonna explain the technique and you don't have to be a lucid dreamer to see that you exist right now in a special type of mental creation. So here's what I want you to do. A lot of you have heard about the law of attraction and all that kind of stuff. This, this is a little bit similar, but, but unique. It's something I created. Think of a neutral characteristic that you have. You might say, oh, I'm not attractive, but I'm not unattractive, I'm neutral. Or you might say, well, I'm not really funny, but I'm not, not funny, I'm neutral when it comes to being funny. You have to find something neutral. And you might not even think about neutral stuff very much because, it, because it's so neutral. So then this is what you want to do. You want to supersize that neutral belief. So for example, 10 times a day for one minute, tell yourself that you are the funniest person in your country. <laughs> that you're so funny that the country wouldn't exist without your funniness. You, are, you walk in the room and people think you're funny. Just by staring at you, people think you're funny. 
You, and for a minute, imagine how funny you are. Don't tell any of your friends you're doing this. Don't tell anyone. But for 10 minutes a day, what, at one minute intervals, tell yourself that you're the funniest person there. If you do this day after day after day, by day four or five, you'll be at the uh, supermarket paying for your groceries. You'll say something and everyone will start laughing. And you'll think <laughs> that wasn't even funny. Or you'll be at some event and you'll say something and everyone will begin laughing. And you'll think that was not even funny. You'll realize that you're a projector. You're projecting your mental energy out there and the world is reflecting it back to you. Hmm. So in my 30 day workshop, a woman who was living on Bermuda, who's 55 or something, she began to tell herself that she was the most attractive woman on Bermuda, that she was the goddess of women on Bermuda. There was no one more attractive than her. And she said on day four of doing this, a guy in his twenties or thirties asked her for her phone number. She said no one had asked her for her phone number in 25 years. And she even had her wedding ring on. She thought, what is this guy doing? And she was wearing, you know, a beat up uh, t-shirt and everything. She said she hadn't washed her hair that day or any of that. Again, we're projectors. And that's when you begin to realize that Maya is re really about creative transformation. Our energy gets projected out from us and reflected back to us. But anyway, Try it yourself, see it for yourself. And when you see that, then you'll have your mind blown. It, it's, it's really uh, extraordinary. Thank you, Robert. I'm definitely going to, going to try that one. Um, Martina, uh, Martina Medinica, we've got about, about five more minutes, uh, possibly a bit longer. So there's just a five, six minute warning there, maybe a couple of, of other questions. But uh, Martina uh, Medinica, are you around there? Have you got your yeah, hand? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I don't have a web camera, so it's audio only. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So um, I've been aware of this uh, method that you were talking about, about uh, focusing on your hands and telling yourself that I will be aware of my dream if I see my, my hands in my dream. And I've been trying all kinds of stuff to do to be aware to, you know, to know that I'm lucid dreaming. But uh, the only trigger I had is like when it's earthquake going on and very severe, severe one. But after a while, um, this trigger stopped. So I cannot and uh, I haven't been dreaming about earthquake. They were all mild and nothing to trigger my awareness of the dream. So I don't know how to go back because I, I need, you know, to be aware to to heal my own traumas, to heal my own uh, personal problems. Right. And and, and that's why I, I in my books, I'll, I'll give a dozen uh, lucid dream induction techniques. And even today I gave four techniques. So, so if your dream signs aren't working anymore, then use one of the other techniques. Um, when you wake up at four o'clock in the morning to get a drink of water, take the drink of water and then, then say, one, this is a dream. Two, this is a dream. Just quietly relax back into the dream and let the dream begin. And you'll hear yourself saying 27, this is a dream. And you'll become lucidly aware. So, so it helps to try a different approach uh, at that time. Uh, and th sometimes that's what happens with a technique. Um, at first, it's really powerful and valuable, but then after a while we get used to it and it loses some of its power and energy. So, so that's why please feel free to take one of those other techniques and uh, use it. Thank you, Martina. I think we've got time for, for a couple more. I just, I'm going to ask Jeffrey uh, Lubin's question on, on his behalf. I hope that's okay, Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey wants to know, how does Freud and dream analysis relate to lucid dreaming? What's the connection? You know, um, uh, Freud uh, uh, felt that all dreams were wish fulfillment, but he also said that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. And I think lucid dreaming shows when you're consciously aware of being in the dream, 
then you can directly begin to interact with the unconscious mind by just asking questions. Hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. Or, hey, dream, let me experience unconditional love or whatever. So, so the thing about Freud, though, is uh, there is a lot of wish fulfillment that you see in a lucid dream. If I expect when I open that door that there's going to be beautiful women inside the room, when I open that door, what's inside the room? Beautiful women. The lucid dream reflects your expectations. So if I see a man in a black coat and expect that he's a gangster, then he'll turn around in the lucid dream and he'll have a gun in his hand. But if I see a man in a black coat and expect that he's a priest, he'll turn around and he'll have a, a cross or something, a real spiritual objects. So in lucid dreaming, we see that the dream reflects our mind our beliefs, our expectations, our focus, our intent, our will, and also our larger awareness. And when you begin to see how dreams are created, then, then you begin to see, oh, now I, now I understand this first step. But it took me 10 years to understand how dreams are created. But it's through one's beliefs, expectation, focus, intent, will, emotions, and also their larger awareness, this non-visible awareness. So, so anyway, uh, um, I wish Freud could have read my first book. Um, I, I think he would have had his mind blown. So. <laughs> well, you mentioned Jung earlier, and I just want to dig a bit deeper into that last question, because is there, you mentioned the priest, and you know, if we expect to see a priest, we see a priest. If we expect to see a detective, we see a detective. Are there any uh, sort of universal figures or is there sort of a shared symbology or archetypes that everybody encounters in dreams um, that sort of cross-cultural? So here's what you see is that the principles are the same for every lucid dreamer. Lucid dreamers around the world, no matter what culture you are in, they'll discover that if you get too excited, boom, you pop out of the lucid dream. Lucid dreamers will also discover that there's three ways that a lucid dream ends. You tell yourself to wake up, you wake up. Sometimes you think the lucid dream is coming to an end because it's so shaky. And then you wake up in your bed and you look at the floor and you think, when did we get a blue carpet? Our carpet isn't blue. And then you realize, oh, I'm still dreaming. That's what we call false awakening. But there's one other way that you that a lucid dream ends. And that's when you go to what people call the void. So imagine a sparkling realm of blackness. So the lucid dream comes to an end, but instead of waking up, you find yourself in the void. Now, the interesting thing is, if you hang out in the void, and you have to keep your mind active and not tell yourself to wake up, if you hang out in the void, you'll watch a new lucid dream begin. So you're seeing all this sparkling blackness, and then all of a sudden, a tree starts over there, and a house shows up there, and then a, a hill starts over there. And now you realize that a new dream is occurring. Most of us just become aware of dreaming within the dream. We've never saw the birth of a, lucid, of a dream, or the birth of a lucid dream. But that's why you have rapid eye movement. Oh, a bush appeared. Oh, now there's a house. Oh, now there's a bridge. Oh, there goes a bird. Oh, now there's a, a dog. That's why we have rapid eye movement. You see it just immediately. It's, you watch it appear in the void. So all these things occur. It, it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or Japanese or Argentina, lucid dreamer, or from wherever. I can talk about all of this with an experienced lucid dreamer, and they'll go, exactly, yes. And they go exactly yes, because there's a common set of principles and the principles are common. I don't think the dream symbols are common, but the principles of how it all works are common. I hope that helps. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we've got time for one more question. And I wish Robert, you could come around and have dinner at my house and we could, 
continue this discussion. Um, you're very welcome. Um, Matt has a question, and uh, that will be our last one. Um, so before, while we're finding Matt, and Matt's got her, her hand up, um, after Matt's uh, asked her question, uh, we'll, make, we'll make sure that everyone knows uh, that Robert's going to be uh, a guest at our, our Uplucid Summit, which is happening in November. I'm looking forward to that. And also that next, next in two weeks' time, actually, on the 21st of October, we have Nia Tadmore, who's a psychotherapist specially, specializing in psychedelic harm reduction. He'll be sharing his experiences of providing psychedelic crisis intervention at music festivals, along with uh, some probably actually fairly closely linked explorations there into the ethical challenges around this issue and some, some guidelines he's developed um, about working in this understudied field. So that's on the 21st of October. Um, you can check all of that out at uplucid.org. Um, so uh, are you there, Matt? Do you have your hand? Okay. So, so we've got, Matt's not there at the moment, but just, just to finish, um, Robert, I've got just one more for you. Could, you. could you share with us an experience where a dream figure communicated to you real life information. I think you've touched on a couple of these things before. Um, but that's, that's, that's sort of powerful stuff. <laughs> so, so, boy, um, I, I could go a whole lot of ways here. Uh, but, uh, but, but probably the best example is um, um, m my father died about 20 years ago. And, and I thought I'd wait three months and then try to find him in a lucid dream. And, and, uh, and so what happened was this, I became lucid. I remember I wanted to find my father and then all the dream figures told me it wasn't time. It's just not time. Don't do it. And because they were all in unanimous opinion, I then had the dream figures. I would point at things in the dream and then they had to tell me the symbolic meaning of that item. And it was really incredible as I pointed at everything, they explained it. So, so in the morning I thought, you know, that's, that's probably a good idea. Maybe my dad's not ready, maybe I'm not ready. Uh, I'll just wait, if my dad ever wants to come to me, I'll just wait. So it was about three years later, I see this gold ladder and coming down the ladder is my father. And the first thing I, I become lucidly aware because I think, oh, he, he died three years ago. But I begin to laugh because he has such a bad haircut, I think, this guy can't even get a good haircut in the after death state. <laughs> but then I thought, well, wait a second. Is this my father as a dream symbol or is this my father as a spiritual being in the after death state? And so he comes down, we say hi to each other. Then I say, dad, you're from the land of the dead. When do you think mom is going to pass away? And he goes, oh, probably in two to six years. I say, of what? He says, a heart condition. And that really surprised me because my mom had never had any heart problems. She's 10 years younger than my dad. And then I asked him another question and he responded. And then he told me, please be quiet because I came to tell you things. And then he told me all the things he wanted to tell me. Almost two years exactly later, my mom went to the hospital and almost died of a heart uh, condition. And then about three and some years after that, she almost died again because she was taking a prescribed medication that was harming her heart. And so again, you see that, that that takes a long time to see if the answer was correct, but, but it turned out to be correct. But again, all dream figures are not created equal. Uh, um, I would not ask random dream figures for uh, life advice, uh, but if I did meet a deceased relative, uh, I'd pay attention to what they say. But anyway, that's a, that's a, lovely, uh, a lovely question and there's, there's a lot more you could go into there. Thank you, Robert. I think I think that's all we've got time for. So I'm very sorry if we didn't catch everybody. But you know where to find Robert um, <laughs> if if you uh, if you would like to connect more and to uh, to look into some of Robert's courses and Robert's books. Um, Robert will be, as I said, coming to join us at the at the Uplucid Summit in November, which we're all looking forward to. And just thank you so much. Uh, to all of you for engaging with this and, and for posing your questions and asking such such useful and, and insightful, universally pertinent and interesting questions. 
and and thank you to you, Robert. I've just been struck by by the by the the energy and the the joy and the warmth um, uh, that comes out. And I I'm I'm hugely inspired as someone who never remembers their dreams to to have a crack at it tonight. And we can we we've got the chance every night. So thank you so much, uh, Robert, for joining us. And I really look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you to everyone. Uh, really great to see you. And I, I hope you can join us for Nia Tadmore's con uh, conference in, uh, on the 21st of October. We've got a free event on psychedelic crisis and harm reduction. And uh, just check the website uplucid.org for more information on that. Really great to see you. Uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye-bye.